Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Science on the Sound lecture series. Uh, my name is Joe Hoyt, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here tonight. I'm glad to see so many people came out. Uh, you've got uh, a, just an incredible amount of history here on the Outer Banks, so it's, it's really wonderful to see so many people recognizing that and want to spend their time learning a little bit more about, um, about the incredible things that are off your shores here. Uh, I work for the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, and we have uh, the rare privilege of protecting uh, special places in the oceans. The National Marine Sanctuaries is somewhat similar to national parks in that we have these, these um, 15 sites throughout the uh, U.S. Uh, waters and territorial waters that protect these iconic places uh, in our seas. Uh, many of those are focused on the natural environment, uh, but we also have many that focus on the historical environment. So the uh, shipwrecks and maritime heritage and the cultural landscapes that, um, that are so important to people that live along the shores. Uh, the site that I've been working at for the last 10 years and I've had the privilege to partner with folks here at Coastal Studies Institute uh, is at the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary. We manage the site of the Civil War ironclad USS Monitor that's lost off the coast of North Carolina. Uh, but we have a broader program in NOAA that focuses on maritime heritage throughout the national system. Uh, so I'm currently uh, acting as the National Maritime Heritage Coordinator uh, in that capacity. So we've, uh, we've been managing the site of the monitor since the mid-70s. Uh, but over the last 10 years or so, we've really begun looking uh, at this broader story of maritime heritage uh, off the coast of North Carolina. And that's what I'm going to talk to you guys about tonight. Uh, so I just have a question. You guys can shout it out if, you, if something comes to mind. When you think of World War II history and you think of places, what, what kind of places uh, pop to your head? Germany? Pacific? Normandy? Iwo Jima? All these places. That's, that is, that's exactly right. I mean, when people think of World War II, they think of these faraway places. It's something that happened over there. It's something that, that was a foreign war. You know, at the beginning of World War II, you know, America didn't really particularly want to be involved in another, another world war. Uh, so this, this idea of it happening in these faraway places is really what still is rooted in the minds of, of many Americans today. Uh, but in reality, there was an American theater of World War II that um, hasn't really received its fair share of, of credit in the story that it, that it tells, uh, and that is the story of the Battle of the Atlantic. Uh, so in really rough terms, the Battle of the Atlantic uh, is what you would call war on commerce. Uh, following the end of World War I, uh, Germany was pretty clear after the Battle of Jutland and other, other engagements that Germany wasn't really going to have the, the capacity to compete on the high seas with with the, uh, the, the British Navy. And in the interwar period, they began developing uh, more and more U-boat technology and things uh, to, if they're not able to compete head-to-head -head in a traditional naval engagement, what they can do is they can cut off the flow of uh, supplies to the UK. So, you know, if the UK and Britain is, uh, it's an island nation, right? So everything that they have uh, in this period to, to fuel that war machine has to be shipped in from somewhere else. So predominantly, those are things like finished goods, but really it's raw materials. So fuel uh, and, uh, and other consumables that are used to kind of fuel that, that war machine. It's really, if you think of, uh, think of fuel oil in particular as a, a major artery that pumped, pumped life into the ability of the Allied war effort. Uh, and where does a huge amount of fuel come from? Right, the Gulf of Mexico and, and the, uh, at, uh, up the East Coast. So what's happening here is uh, ships coming into, uh, into the European theater and the, uh, the German Kriegsmarine trying to cut off that, su that supply uh, that is so critical to the war effort. And that's really what the strategic element of this area is. So you've got, you've got uh, giant tankers coming out of the Gulf, running up the Gulf Stream along the East Coast and heading towards Europe. And, and that's putting fuel into the RAF planes that are making bombing raids. It's putting fuel into the, the tanks. Uh, they're supplying guns. They're supplying food. All these things are being shipped in. So if Germany could disrupt that, that was, that was a, a, a severe uh, blow to the ability to wage war. This is one of my favorite quotes 
Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to bludgeon you with too many of these throughout the, the discussion. But the Battle of the Atlantic was the dominating factor all through the war. Never for one moment could we forget that everything happening elsewhere, on land, at sea, or in the air, depended ultimately on its outcome. That's Winston Churchill. That's how critical the Battle of the Atlantic was. It's also the longest continuous campaign of World War II, and this is, this is one of the things, as, uh, as you see later in the talk, that kind of presents us these challenges. You think of a, of a World War II battle or a World War II battlefield as sort of these discrete events. You know, Normandy or the, the D-Day landings happened, you know, just the course of, you know, sh a relatively short period of time in the scheme of the larger war. So you think of these kind of small, you know, individual battlefields that together constitute this larger war. The Battle of the Atlantic was an ongoing campaign, so it really began at the very beginning of uh, World War II, but years before uh, the uh, Americans entered, and went all the way up to the very end. For the American theater, uh, again, we were quite isolationist at the time that, uh, that World War II began and reticent to become involved. Um, of course, that, um, that changed on December 7th when Pearl Harbor was attacked. And by December 11th, Germany is declaring war on the United States, just a few days later. And a week after they declared war, the first U-boat set sail for the coast of the United States. So the, the Battle of the Atlantic was already happening before the U.S. entered the war. And so the Germans were really well prepared to just shift their already active assets into combat. And by, uh, by the first, you know, second week of January, the first U-boats arrive uh, off the American shore and start sinking their targets. And by January 18th in 1942, the first ship is sunk off the coast of North Carolina here. And this really began uh, a six-month period uh, until about mid-July of 1942, where an enormous number of wrecks were sunk along the coast. And this really struck fear into uh, uh, the Navy and into the, the folks along the coastline because this is suddenly something that seems so far away is, is very, very real. And the Outer Banks were at the forefront of that. Uh, in the 1940s, the Outer Banks were you know, quite remote. They're you know, reasonably remote in 2019. So these, these folks were seeing these things uh, firsthand, and it was really uh, kind of unrepresented in the American consciousness because there was just so much going on. Uh, but there were uh, classic things that you hear still today, when in doubt, lights out, loose lips, sink ships, all these phrases that you hear come from this campaign of, of these vessels being uh, moving around and how critical they were. Um, and what, what's really interesting here, and I think uh, you'll hear as I continue to talk this, this evening, is the story of the Merchant Marine. Uh, one of the things that we have as an ongoing effort at NOAA is to try to protect some of these wrecks that are off your shores here and really memorialize and tell the story of the Merchant Marine who have, have gotten a pretty hard shake uh, in, in their role in World War II, uh, whereas they had um, uh, the highest statistical casualty rate of any of the armed services. So you're more likely to lose your life in World War II as a member of the Merchant Marine than you were if you were a Marine or in the Navy or any other branch of military service. Although they, they weren't recognized uh, as veterans, they had no veteran status. Uh, they got some partial veteran status established in the, in the 1980s. Uh, where they told a bunch of guys in their 70s that they could have the GI Bill uh, in case they wanted to go to college <laughs> and, uh, and maybe help, help with a loan on their first house. But it was really, uh, th these guys were really critical and their story is really underrepresented and it's something that I think is a really unique American story about resilience and, and fortitude that um, is best represented here off the East Coast. So, as I said, we had this six-month period of time where ships are being sunk uh, with relative impunity. And, you know, we have this perspective of, of America being, you know, the mightiest, you know, player in World War II. So why, why did we have this period where we were losing so many ships? And again, part of that is that the, the support for the war, at least initially, was in the Pacific Theater. We just suffered the Pearl Harbor attacks. Many of, the, uh, many of the naval assets that we did have on hand at that time were allocated to the Pacific Theater. And many of, this, many of the assets that we had leading up to this period were sort of uh, shifted o already over to the British under Lend-Lease uh, and other programs that allowed um, uh, our allies to have access to some of those vessels, but really left us relatively uh, under 
uh, protected along the East Coast. We did a number of things uh, that are significant to this area. Uh, some failed countermeasures. One is uh, setting up mines, uh, sea mines uh, in the area to try to um, protect some of the vessels as they're transiting up and down the coast. This is a really interesting case. Uh, there was only uh, a couple of places in the entire uh, U.S. where they tried to do this. One here uh, out of Ocracoke, and you'll still see it on the modern charts if you're out on the water, it's marked as a danger area. They put out a couple thousand uh, Mark VI mines uh, to create a, a sort of a temporary anchorage for transiting vessels. Uh, and they also set up a, a, a minefield in the, the Florida Keys. Um, unfortunately, all these defensive minefields ever did was sink our own ships. Uh, so they were, they were pretty uh, quickly removed. Uh, but there's a few shipwrecks that are off the coast here that are a result of, of this minefield. This is the F.W. Abrams that uh, if you guys are into diving along the shores here, it's a, a really beautiful site to visit. Uh, so really for this, uh, this six-month window, we were trying things like that. We're throwing up uh, defensive minefields, uh, but all the while we're actively working towards reinstituting a convoy system. This, we'd learned from World War I that convoy systems were effective. It just took us a little bit of time to get coordinated and get the assets that we need to, to do this. In the interim, really any ship that was available uh, was put into, into service. So this is uh, fishing trawlers, private yachts on donation, you know, slap on a deck gun, some, uh, some depth charge racks and, and send it out to sea. And um, so it really kind of, it, it really sort of represented the, the resilience uh, of this period and uh, the unpreparedness that, that was there. And it, the end result of this engagement, at least as it's represented off of the coast of North Carolina was just in this short window of time, 91 ships were lost alone off of off the Carolinas. 79 merchant ships, eight allied naval ships, that's British uh, and uh, American predominantly, and four uh, German U-boats. Out of that number, uh, 1,657 were uh, casualties occurred just off of North Carolina, and 1,200 of those were merchant mariners. So this area is truly a, a submerged grave. It's a, it's, a, it's a war grave, it's a battlefield, and it's a place of, uh, uh, of just immense meaning. And so what we've begun doing is, uh, over the last 10 years, in partnership with with CSI and a number of other folks in the region, other federal agencies, uh, East Carolina University, we've begun this comprehensive inventory of these World War II wrecks to, to better understand what's out there and how this is represented. And in the process of that, I've begun understanding this area really as a battlefield and trying to interpret it as such. And we're really at this interesting time where if you, if you look out on the sea, what, you know, what, what's, what's one of the main characteristics when you look out, you know, stand on the beach and you look out at the ocean? It's just vast, right? It's just this open, sort of featureless expanse. And when you think of a battlefield, if you go to a place like Gettysburg or Shiloh or Little Bighorn, you see features in the landscape, an area of high ground, uh, maybe a trench, uh, a tree line, some of these features in the landscape that you can understand how troops would move within it and how they would operate and how the terrain, how the landscape would influence tactics, right? And that's what we would call battlefield archaeology. So we begun approaching the naval battlefield of the Battle of the Atlantic off North Carolina in the same, the same way that you would look at it on, uh, on land, but having to tweak it a little bit. And we're in this really exciting time in this type of research because for, really, for the first time, we're able to visualize these in a, in a different way. So we're able to, we're able to go out there with divers, with uh, human-occupied vehicles, with remote op, op, remotely operated vehicles, with autonomous vehicles, with cameras, with lasers, with acoustic stuff, all these things that we have at our fingertips now that we can visualize these things, sort of virtually raise them, interpret the relationship to, another, to, to one another geospatially, and 
for the first time, kind of peel back the ocean, peel back that sort of featureless landscape and, and understand why this area is really significant and why it's really unique. Because although it looks featureless, there are all these elements of the landscape that uh, tactically influence the battlefield and why this particular area is so significant. So a number of those things are, you know, one, the shipping lanes. You got to have ships to sink, right, if that's your, that's your goal. Uh, so historically, you know, this area, even prior to World War II, was always a historic thoroughfare. So from the colonial period onward, ships would come up uh, a lot, using the Gulf Stream up along the East Coast, and the Gulf Stream kind of hakes, you know, it's a perfect uh, natural moving walkway that sends you back over to Europe. So this was a, a natural uh, shipping lane. And then if you look here, you've got uh, this little line represents the continental shelf. And because the East Coast of the United States is a divergent zone, the continental shelf up here is pretty wide. So you've got a high concentration of shipping that's up off of the uh, you know, uh, New York and Boston Harbor and all this area. But because you've got this really wide shelf, the water depth is quite shallow, hundreds of miles offshore. You can see how far it is here. Now here, off Hatteras, the continental shelf comes very close. It's the closest point on the East Coast. So you get this bottleneck of shipping. And the way that the U-boats like to operate was they wanted to have uh, a high concentration of shipping where they wanted access to deep water to evade counterattack, right? So, so they could come in here and attack ships, but then be able to get into deep water, whereas up here, they were vulnerable. So interestingly, the, um, uh, the, the U-boats, we believed at the time, early in the war, that there's, there's no way that the Germans could build a, sh a submarine that was capable of diving deeper than our American subs. Uh, which w at the time was about 250 feet operationally. Uh, well, the German subs could dive to about 750 feet. So how do you think we designed our depth charges? We designed them to operate up to about 250 feet. So they really liked this deep water. And um, the, uh, so there's, there's all these, these other features in the landscape as well. The water temperature, um, you, why, why white, Sorry, why might water temperature have some sort of operational impact on, on U boat activity? Any ideas? Buoyancy? Buoyancy, maybe. But down, have you ever gone on the beach at night and when it's nice and warm and kicked your foot through the, through the surf? And bioluminescence, right? So at night, if you're down in these warmer waters, you could see uh, you were easy to spot from aircraft. And a lot of this uh, activity was happening from Jan you know, you know, winter time up, up through spring. So the waters were quite cool uh, farther north. But it's really interesting because you had, up until this, this time period, really World War I, World War II, <clears throat> a naval battlefield really took place on that flat planar surface, right? You know, if you had two ships with cannons and sails and they're battling each other, you know, they have to, you know, the weather is a factor, the wind direction, these sorts of things, maybe the shoreline. Uh, but in general, the activity is happening on that, on that planar surface of the sea. But here, now we have U-boats that are operating in that water column. So they're interacting with the, you know, the, the, the contours of the seabed, the bathymetry itself is a factor. Uh, you also have aircraft, so in that atmospheric column, uh, you've got operational limits of those aircraft, how far they can see, where their bases are, what the weather conditions are, and then you still have this planar surface. So we've gone, you know, in a short period of time, a naval battlefield was, you know, this kind of two-dimensional thing to really this 3D landscape, but it's also really hard to get your head around. So that's what a lot of our, our research is focused on, is trying to capture these stories and be able to, to articulate why this area is a battlefield and why this area, we think, is a significant enough battlefield for the American story to be remembered and protected. Uh, and again, this is, uh, it's a story of North Carolina, it's a story of America, but it's also a story of the world. And if you look at the ships that are off the, off the coast here, uh, you know, the majority of them are American vessels, but you've got Yugoslavian, Soviet vessels, Panamanian vessels, Norwegian, Nicaraguan, Latvian, Greek, German, British, Belgian, Brazilian. It is a world war 
and it is represented here. These, these nations are all, uh, these are shipwrecks and uh, ships that were attacked off our shores uh, that are still represented here in this, this really amazing collection. Now I should say one of the great things about this area being so strategically valuable uh, is because you had these shallow water shipping lanes, high concentration shipping. What is good about shallow water? Hal and Penny know. <laughs> we can go there, right? As shipwrecks, we can go, as researchers, we can visit these places. The, uh, uh, as uh, uh, a diving community can visit these places, the fishing community can vis visit all these places. They're, it's really just a tremendous uh, resource that we have off the coast here. Uh, again, so we've, we've taken a lot of this data, uh, all these ships that have, uh, that have been attacked or have been sunk, We've modeled it, tried to understand sort of geospatially where the density of the battle, where these strategic hot spots of activity were. That's what this, uh, this image is showing you here. And have really tried to kind of understand how can, we, how can we communicate this idea of a battlefield most effectively. Uh, and then we go out and have the privilege of visiting some of these unique and, and beautiful sites and document them and try to tell these stories and try to share, these, share this history. Uh, these are some uh, photo mosaics that we've done years ago. And this, I've sort of set this up to sort of show you the, the evolution of uh, some of the things that we've done to, to capture these images. These are uh, a series of photographs that are sort of stitched together to create an image of the wreck. This is the U85. How many people here are familiar with the U85? A few? It's just, that's about 14 miles from where we are right now, that wreck. They're just out of Oregon Inlet. And uh, that is about half of my commute to work every day. That's how close these things were and, and remain to, to us here in the States. Um, and then we go out uh, and, and do detailed drawings of these sites, pull you know, divers down there, pulling little tiny measurements, understanding exactly what the state of preservation is. You know, we're beholden to some National Historic Preservation laws to record these in, in a particular way and start to you know, begin to track uh, impacts, both natural and human impacts, uh, that happen to these sites over time. But in order to do that, we sort of need to develop these baseline data sets. So that's what we've really been focusing on for the last 10 years or so. Uh, and we're getting better and better at that. This is an example of, uh, this is a great story. Uh, so this is a cool image of photogrammetry is a mouthful, uh, but it's a, a kind of a, a new emerging uh, element, critical element in uh, recording shipwreck sites. And what this allows you to do is take a series of you know, one or 2,000 images and process them all together uh, and reference them to one another and create a 3D model uh, of the wreck itself uh, in a really pretty short amount of time. So this, is a, this site's in about 320 feet of water uh, and the images to create this 3D model were done in, in a single 30 minute dive uh, and then we're able to have this, this kind of permanent really detailed record of the site. Now the story of this site, this is, this is called the USS YP-389, and this is just a fantastic story that really uh, sort of is very typical of the Battle of the Atlantic, and this was a, uh, uh, a North Sea fishing trawler, or New England fishing trawler, excuse me, a New England fishing trawler called the Cohasset that was um, pressed into service uh, and turned into a, a yard patrol boat and set out uh, to essentially, remember that minefield that was accidentally sinking all of our boats? They said, oh, we better put somebody out there to warn these guys of, uh, of the entrance to this minefield. So these, these guys were out there, you know, basically on patrol, uh, making sure that nobody got into this minefield. And uh, as a result, the U-boat that was operating in the area kept seeing this little patrol craft and believed, you know, they must be tracking me in some way, not realizing that they're just, you know, kind of going back and forth. So they, uh, rather than expend one of their limited torpedoes, they uh, engaged in about an hour and a half long uh, surface fight with this little 100 foot long yard patrol boat uh, that resulted in the loss of six U.S. sailors uh, and the U-boat you know, was successful in sinking it, but we got it. We got it. a couple weeks later, we sunk the 701 also off North Carolina. Uh, 
So we were able to go out and capture these types of stories and these images. Uh, this is an example of multi-beam sonar that we do off of some of our, our NOAA vessels. Uh, this is a wreck called the British Splendor uh, that was a tanker that was sunk, uh, again, just off of the Hatteras area and about a little less than 100 feet of water. And uh, again, beautiful dive site, wonderful place to visit, but these allow us to get these uh, really cool uh, snapshots in time of what these things look like. Again, this is, this is a, sorry, this is a multi-beam sonar image that we've, we've used to locate the site of the YP-389. Um, and there's varying degrees of quality of multi-beam. This is a kind of a wide area search. Um, this is a more detailed, high resolution multi-beam. Uh, and then that allows us to get back down on these sites and, and really uh, zero in and collect the, uh, the, the imagery and the data that we need to be able to tell that story. The, obviously, one of the uh, things that helped us identify that little boat uh, was the presence of this 3-inch 23 caliber deck gun that is generally not on a fishing trawler. Probably some fishing trawlers, but... <laughs> but we thought, that's got to be it. Um, so again, this is just a really great story because it shows, it shows the, um, how we were adapting vessels that really weren't intended for use during the early part of uh, our engagement in the Valley Atlantic, but we're still out there doing the, doing the job and sacrificing to, to keep the country safe. Uh, again, this is the, the crew list of the guys off the, the YP-389 um, that were lost. So we had, um, just to give you an example of the progression of quality, this was uh, in 2009 when we relocated the site of the YP-389. We had a uh, uh, sort of lower resolution camera system that we were able to, to stitch together a photo mosaic. And then in 2016, working with Project Baseline, an avocational uh, and volunteer group of divers, uh, they were able to get this much, much more detailed image. And, it's hard to tell at this scale where you're sitting, but if you zoom in on this, you can see the, just the tiniest you know, things the size of my thumbnail. It's incredibly detailed. So I talked a lot uh, and really quickly um, uh, about this idea of a battlefield and how it's this large area over this you know, extended period of time. And how, so how do you really kind of capture that notion of a battlefield. And in our research, we found one of the coolest stories uh, was this battle of KS-520, this one particular convoy battle that happened off the coast of North Carolina on July 15th of 1942. And this really kind of bookends that period of time from the you know, beginning of January till mid-July uh, of, of, of the Battle of the Atlantic off of North Carolina. So really after this, the, the German uh, Kriegsmarine, the U-boat arm, they recognized that we had gotten so good at, at anti-submarine warfare uh, that they really removed their focus off the East Coast. They set some things down into the Gulf of Mexico. They maintained a presence, but effectively off of our shores here, uh, this was the end of the of the U-boat war uh, off of North Carolina. There's still some act, you know, some some activity, but this was the, the, the sort of the, the, the major uh, bookend to that, that six month window. Uh, and we thought, man, if we could find this site, what a great, what a great way to, tell this, to help us tell this story. Uh, but at the time, uh, it was unknown. And, and the story of KS 520 is really interesting. Uh, it was a convoy, KS 520 is a uh, convoy uh, designation that stands for Key West South. It's the KS, Key West South. And they assembled 19 ships uh, in Norfolk, and then were heading down to Key West. And the, uh, this is roughly the assembly of the vessels. Uh, so the merchant vessels were escorted by five military vessels made up of Coast Guard and Navy surface vessels, as well as, uh, as, well as aircraft. There were some Navy Kingfisher aircraft that were also escorting the convoy. So this is a really organized, we've, we've gotten our act together, and uh, we're, not taking any, we're not taking any gruff at this point. And uh, so these guys assembled on the 14th of July and began moving, uh, moving south, uh, escorted by these vessels. Now, 
as I said, we're getting better by this time, and a few days prior to this, the U-576 uh, had reported back to U-boat base in France that it had sustained some damage from an aerial bombardment. It reported some damage to its ballast system uh, and was unsure whether or not it was going to be able to continue the fight. That's really kind of the last we hear of the 576, but we know at that time that they moved over 100 miles offshore, and they must have felt that they fixed whatever problem they identified enough because they came back inshore and on the 15th intercepted the KS-520 convoy and lined up for a full uh, attack in the middle of the afternoon uh, on these ships. So a, a Type 7C U-boat, which is what the U-576 was, they had four bow tubes, four torpedo tubes in the bow, and they launched a textbook attack, launched a full bow salvo of four torpedoes spread into this convoy. They were lined up, we believe, I've got a slide later on that'll show you, but they were kind of over in this region, and they fired into the convoy, striking the flagship, the JMO Winkle, the uh, Chalor, which is, oh, sorry, the Cholor is here, the JMO Winkle, and then the Bluefields was struck with the fourth torpedo. Uh, so all four torpedoes found their target. One of the vessels was hit twice. Uh, now, the Mo Winkle and the Cholor, uh, they were uh, sailing in ballast, which is to say they didn't have any cargo at the time. They were on their way to pick up cargo. And if you didn't have a full load, you were less likely to sink. So these, these vessels didn't actually sink they were damaged and they limped out of the field of fire and unfortunately directly into our minefield where they struck mines again. <laughs> and, uh, but the, the freighter Bluefields was a smaller ship and it, um, uh, it was sunk immediately. Again, here's the, this is the minefield, this is a map of the minefield off of, off of Ocracoke uh, and Hatteras area. Uh, now, the Mo Winkle and the Chalor, they spent a few days uh, in that area trying to be assisted. There's a small wreck that's out there called the, uh, the Kashina. It was a, a, a rescue tug commission, or, uh, contracted by the Navy to s try to pull these vessels out. That vessel struck a mine when it was trying to assist these and is still sunk there today where this was occurring. The Mo Winkle never did sink. It was able to get back up to Norfolk and was refitted. Uh, the Chalor uh, was towed almost back to Norfolk and sunk just on the approaches of the Chesapeake Bay. So it's, it was lost, but not, not here. Um, but the, uh, the, the Bluefields was lost uh, immediately. Now, what we think happened is the, as soon as these, you know, this, this convoy's sailing south, everything's, everything's going fine, and then all of a sudden you've got three ships on fire, and immediately after that, the U-boat popped to the surface in the center of the convoy, which is the exact opposite of what you want to do with, your, with a U-boat, right? U-boat's supposed to go under the water. And what we think happened is the... Uh, the U-boat had reported some damage uh, a few days prior to its ballast system, and what it is likely is that when it suddenly lost all the weight of those torpedoes, it wasn't able to appropriately compensate for that loss of weight, and it popped to the surface. Well, as soon as it popped to the surface, the, there was an armed guard crew, a naval armed guard crew aboard uh, the Unicoi, a merchant ship, uh, that immediately opened fire, claiming a direct hit and those two Navy Kingfisher aircraft swooped in and straddled it with depth charges. So in about a 15 minute window, everything is calm to you've got three ships on fire and the U-boat sunk in a, a pretty small area. So we thought, this is just a great example of this idea of a battlefield where you have both the, the sort of the victim and the aggressor all sort of represented, but we didn't know where it was. So we decided that um, this would be a good, uh, a good thing to begin to study to, tr again, apply this battlefield archaeology to, tr to try to understand these sites in that more comprehensive and broad way, uh, and then hopefully locate these sites as well. So we partnered with East Carolina University. Uh, they were successful in getting a grant through the American Battlefield Protection Program to conduct this assessment of, um, 
uh, of the battlefield. So this con consisted of digital reconstructions of fields of view that aircraft would have had, how far could the uh, periscope see at periscope depth, what are the operational limits of, of, uh, of a torpedo from a German submarine, all these different factors we began to sort of model out and understand where this was happening. Uh, now, of course, it's all theoretical until we know exactly where these vessels are, but this gave us a, a sort of a, an understanding of where the ships were in this convoy. So this, these little green dots represent the, uh, the vessels, uh, the, the merchant vessels, the three red dots are the three ships that were, were attacked, and then uh, the green ones, or the, I'm sorry, the, the yellow ones are the escort vessels. And then this is our, our best guess of where the U-boat would have been based on its operational limitations. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we then began trying to locate these sites. These are images of the crew of the U-576 who were all lost uh, on that day. To locate the sites, uh, we were presented with some problems and challenges. Uh, we took uh, a, we worked with a, a grad student at East Carolina University who developed these, uh, these probability models based on where the convoys would have been routed. Some of these features in the landscape, you can see this sort of, this little yellow blurb out here is, we know where the minefield was. We know that the Mowinkle and the Chalor were towed into the minefield. So that's kind of, this is sort of a, a heat map probability model that was developed. Um, and again, this is this, that same map prioritized. Now, one of the challenges that we had here is if you see these little triangles, these are all historically reported positions. So th there were five escort vessels and two aircraft, all of which are required to file after action reports after an engagement like this, and they all did. Good for them. The uh, unfortunate thing is they're all describing the same exact event that only happened in one place. And when you plot out where each one of them said it was, it covers about a 300 square mile area. So <laughs> the, uh, these guys over here are the aircraft. They didn't know where they were. Uh, and then these are the, the surface vessels. So we, we took all that along with the, uh, uh, what we knew of the convoy routes. We knew that generally it would follow, follow the 100 fathom curve line. Uh, so we've modeled that in there. And from that we get this, this search area, which we spent a couple of years using various pieces of technology trying to, trying to locate. This is a forward-looking sonar uh, system that we used. Now, this, this number one box is number one priority area, and you'd, you'd ask yourself, well, why didn't you finish num this corner of the number one priority area? Well, there's just limitations of the vehicle that's kind of following the edge of the continental shelf, so we kind of pushed it to the operational limit that we could for the system that we had at that time. Uh, and then worked with other uh, systems over the years to kind of chip away at this, this survey area. Again, I don't know why, we kept on missing this one little corner. Where do you think we found it? <laughs> so if you look right here in this tiny little white tip, about 100 feet from where we first looked for it is where we found it. <laughs> So we would, we would spend a couple of seasons looking in these wide area surveys, and then you know, th there's a trade-off in sonar, essentially. If you, want to see a, if you want to see far, you're seeing fuzzy. If you want to see detail, you're not seeing far at all. So it's sort of the difference between a, like a spotlight and a you know, wide beam. And so it makes it challenging and time-consuming to, to do. And in the course of this, we found several targets. At one point we had over, over 50 targets uh, that were potential wrecks uh, and we'd have to go back and evaluate some of those. This, for example, this is another shipwreck that we found off the coast here uh, that we still don't know the, identif uh, the identity of this site, but this gives you an example of the difference between sort of that wide area survey where you see a little smudge like this and this, just to give you an appreciation for the current out there, we almost didn't mark this because it's so large. This is almost a, almost a mile long here. And we thought, well, it's, geologic, it's a geolo geological feature. Well, it is, but it's a geological feature because the wreck is here and the current is so strong it created this scour pattern behind it that stretches much larger than the actual vessel. So this, with a detailed survey, is what the actual shipwreck looks like. And you can see a lot more 
uh, you know, it's a broken in half ship, it's got a fantail, and you can see that it's got a pilot house. So that's kind of the difference between the two uh, levels of detail that we could get. Um, ultimately, oh, here we are. We were successful. We thought, well, let's try to find the, the Nicaraguan freighter, the Bluefields, first, because it'll be a bigger target. It'll stick up a lot higher. And if we can find that, then we can zero in uh, on finding the U-boat. We thought that might shrink our search area to maybe a couple of miles. We thought, how cool would it be if these were just a few miles apart? Uh, and so we were successful in doing that and back in 2014. We got a target that seemed to line up from our side scan survey uh, with historical images, the size, the general dimensions looked like the uh, looked like it was a good ringer for the for the blue fields. Uh, but of course, it was the last day of the survey, last day of the year, and that was the last survey line that we ran. So that was all we had. And uh, we had a um, uh, NOAA has a large fleet of research vessels that are often transiting around doing other work. And I had a call from, from one of my colleagues there that said, hey, you know, we got this, the Okeanos Explorers transiting through North Carolina. You know, is there anything you want us to take a look at? And I sent him the numbers from this and said, I, you know, take, if you got us, you know, take a look around this area here, a couple miles around this area and see if there's anything else there. And they sent me back this image. And this is the target for the blue fields. And then I said, well, there's this bump over here. It's only 240 meters away, so in a couple, couple football fields away, and I thought, there's no way. It's got to be a piece of the same wreck. Uh, so I had to stare at this for a year <laughs> before we could get back out on the water to see what this little bump is. And when we got out there, this is what we found. So it was the only time that you could definitively identify a shipwreck based on sonar. So I don't know. What do you think? Does it look like a U-boat? <laughs> uh, so this was obviously very exciting. This is a high-resolution uh, multi-beam image that was collected from an autonomous underwater vehicle. Uh, and then now that we found these, these sites, we wanted to get back uh, and, and detail, uh, do a detailed uh, documentation of this, this battlefield site, again, centered around sort of uh, developing this, this area uh, and interpreting it as a, as a national battlefield. To do that, we used a human-occupied vehicles. Uh, this is a two-man Triton submersible that's capable of 1,000 feet uh, of depth. Uh, this was graciously uh, supported by some of our partners at Global Underwater Explorers and Project Baseline. And uh, they had this vehicle, and I had uh, worked with some other partners, and I said, I, I like your vehicle. Can I strap on all these heavy toys? Uh, so we put a laser scanner and a Doppler velocity lock and uh, USBL and all these all these uh, instruments that would allow us to to really document these sites in a really high level of detail. Uh, so we did that uh, in the summer of 2016 uh, and were able to visit visit this battlefield site for the first time since it were lost uh, since they were lost in 1942. So this is uh, this is the U-576. This is the uh, the conning tower area, the, the preservation on the site is unbelievable. It's in about 700 feet of water. Uh, and because it's in that deep of water, it's really a really stable environment. So the, really, the only thing that, you can, that is not on this vessel that would have been on there when it was afloat are some guard rails and some guy wires that ran fore and aft. But otherwise, it's, it's completely intact. Uh, this is the 88 millimeter deck gun. Over here is the uh, uh, ready ammunition locker, still sealed. And one of the first things that we were looking for is trying to determine whether or not you know, what what sunk the vessel. Was it a uh, deck gun from the Unicoi? Was it the aircraft? Uh, and because it, it's so intact, that we really could see no evidence of what uh, what sunk it. No definitive evidence. So this is visiting the site, and one of the first things we looked for was whether or not the hatch covers were open or closed. They did have the ability to escape through the water column, or attempt to escape through the water column, and uh, we could see that all the hatch covers were closed. At that time, we knew that there were 45 uh, German sailors still entombed inside. It's a very solemn place. Uh, and this here is the, uh, uh, the 576. And one that we had two submersibles. So I'm in this one, and, and John back there waving is the one who took this picture and the other submersible. So I have a short 
video to give you an idea of what these places are like. Now, the most amazing thing was to be, you know, you're dropping through the water column. Seven, you're, first, you're dangling from the ship, which is quite terrifying, and you're in a little greenhouse that's about 400 degrees. <laughs> and then you drop through. The, here's the laser scanner uh, on the side here with a company called 2G Robotics. Now, for the laser scanner to work, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, you had to have a really good positioning, and that's what all those other instruments are. So you drop through the water column, and it's, you know, it's silent, and you, to save batteries, you're basically just falling. And you get to the bottom, and one of the first things that we, we saw was the, the 576. Now, it's just unbelievable how intact it is. It's, it's the design of these vessels were such that they had these saddle tanks that ran uh, amidships. So the bow and the stern are actually sitting up off the bottom. If you were free swimming, you could swim underneath the vessel. It's like it's like sitting on, it's almost like it's on display. Just unbelievable. This is the conning tower here uh, with these big snowy grouper hanging out in there. Uh, it's hard to see how dark this is here, but if you see this little blue flashy light here, that's the laser scanning system in action. This is the stern assembly uh, of the 576, the rudders, the props, the diving planes, all perfectly intact, no, no discernible damage. And then when you're tired of looking at the U-boat, you hang a right and swim 200 yards and out, out of the gloom comes the blue fields. And again, this is amazingly intact. The pilot house is still there. Everything is still there, just like it was lost in 1942. Obviously, this one you can see the damage is cracked in half, but it's still, still intact. There's a couple of tr uh, trucks strapped down to the deck. It was a general purpose freighter. Um, and all of this stuff is just still sitting there. It's just this complete sense of awe to see this place. What's different about you know, a battlefield here versus a battlefield that you might go visit in you know, a place like Manassas is that the, you know, those places are kind of curated and they're mowed and they've been used since they were last a battlefield. These, these places, with the exception of some marine growth, are exactly like they were when they were lost in 1942. And they're just one, or two rather, of, of a huge collection of, uh, of these sites off of the coast here that um, uh, represent this battlefield. Uh, so these are some of the results. This is the laser scanning uh, of the U-576. Uh, you can see the, the detail that you get from this laser scanning system. Now getting that, it was really tricky because we had to basically set up a positioning environment on the bottom. We had to set up acoustic receivers around the entire battlefield site so that the sensor was, we had, because you could get such high resolution with a laser scanner, you had to have equally high resolution with the positioning system. And uh, so that was really tricky. Some of these little sort of smears that you see are grouper swimming past the sensor. Get out of the way. Um, but again, incredible preservation. We were able to collect this out of you know, a couple of dives. And then we have this incredibly detailed 3D representation of these sites uh, that you know, just a few years ago would have been impossible for us to capture, particularly in this water depth. So now we have the capacity to go out there, collect these types of things, interpret these things, and be able to share them with people. Because you know, a lot of people on the Outer Banks are aware of this story, but you go to Ohio, where I grew up, this is mind-blowing, and it's, it's really uh, kind of an honor to, to be able to come and visit these places and share them with people, and we just think that this, this history is so critically important and it's so interesting. You know, I had a, uh, had a really interesting experience. We had a, a conference, a colleague of mine uh, from American Battlefield Protection Program was doing a presentation talking about all of the sites in uh, our country that are honored for their place in the American story. So Revolutionary War, Spanish-American War, Civil War, all these places that are set aside that you can go visit and interpret the, this history. But for World War II, we have nothing ex in the continent of the United States except for Valor in the Pacific uh, in, uh, in Pearl Harbor. But this place is where World War II came home and we have not interpreted it appropriately, we've not uh, celebrated its story or honored its story, uh, and it's, like I said, just, just a few miles off of our coast here. So that's what our, our focus has really been uh, over the last few years, is to try to figure out how best to honor the story of the Merchant Marine 
and, and uh, represent this battlefield. And we're working through a process now through the National Marine Sanctuary Program to try to expand the, the current boundaries of the monitor, which is really kind of in the middle of where all these are, to incorporate uh, the, uh, not all of these vessels, but a representative, a representative selection uh, of the Battle of the Atlantic. So hopefully we can continue to do these types of interpretive uh, operations and get people to understand and appreciate just how nationally uh, and really globally significant the, the Outer Banks are uh, in the American story and in World War II history. So with that, I I've just have some images here of, of the site, but I, I can answer any questions that folks might have. Uh, we do have this ongoing process uh, to work towards establishing uh, this. Uh, we're, we're down here pretty often for public hearings and, and events and, and meetings, so I encourage you guys to kind of check us out on, online. Uh, I'll post my contact information and website up here so you can, if you're interested in, in learning more about what we're up to, uh, you can do that. Well, hey, I appreciate everyone spending their evening with me, and it's been, it's been lovely. Thank you.